I actually visited Covenant in March of 1991 just to kind of explore it, visit, uh, check out the facilities and the classes and professors and everything. And I do remember, you know, meeting a lot of people, great conversations, and then looking back on it years later, piecing together, okay, Elizabeth McIntosh was murdered just a year beforehand. No one breathed a word, of course, why would you? That's not a public relations uh, thing you put out there to prospective students uh, or anything. And I just remember coming away from that with a very, um, not, not bizarre feeling, but uh, s sort of like a, a low-grade unsettledness. That's Luke Davis. He's a graduate from Covenant Seminary, a teacher, and also the author of a detective series with one of the books loosely based on the murder of Elizabeth McIntosh. In the last episode, we discussed Covenant's response to Elizabeth's murder and how people around the Covenant community perceived that response. But it's not just about what Covenant did or didn't do. It's as much about the tone that was set. And that tone more or less seemed to be, we don't talk about Elizabeth. Since Covenant is the seminary sponsored by the PCA, we also need to zoom out and talk a little more about what the perception of don't talk about it feels like to people who are less connected to Covenant but have witnessed some of the ways that the PCA responds to problems and questions. And as you're listening, keep in mind that the connection we're trying to draw is not that Covenant or the PCA were necessarily abusive in the way they handled Elizabeth's murder. Rather, people we've talked to have seen connections in the way the PCA handles difficult things and how that culture still responds to Elizabeth's death and the murder investigation today. We are not going after the PCA or Covenant Seminary or anyone else in this series. We're not claiming there's an active cover-up. But as far as Ruth and I are concerned, there are legitimate journalistic questions about the wider cultural dynamics happening around Elizabeth's murder. And since the murder's still unsolved, we think it's fair game to talk about today's PCA culture too. Plenty of ink has been spilled debating the PCA and how conservative and evangelical churches treat women and abuse and misconduct. So we're not going to get into every theological issue, and we're not going to go into detail about every recent abuse scandal. That's just not in the scope of this project. In this episode, you'll hear from two journalists who have covered the PCA and some of its issues. And you'll hear from people within the church who have ties to Covenant Seminary. We're not the only ones who think that there are connections between the PCA's denominational culture, politics, and a seminary that doesn't want to talk about the unsolved murder of Elizabeth McIntosh. This is True Believer, Episode 7. Let's talk about it. Before we get into the episode, I want to acknowledge that we've heard from listeners who are anxious for us to get back into the actual murder investigation. I understand that this part of the series might feel like an unnecessary digression, but Ruth and I feel strongly that this is an important part of the story of Elizabeth's murder even if it isn't directly about the murder itself. That's part of why I've never really felt like this was actually a true crime podcast, in the way most people think of that genre. Technically, yes, we're telling the true story of a crime that happened, but it's also about so much more than that. So this is the way we're telling the story. One more thing to add. While we've produced these episodes, lots of people have come to us with important information relevant to Elizabeth's case and it takes us time to responsibly report that information out. But I promise, if you hang in there with us, much more is coming. So with that, now you're going to hear more from Luke Davis. Here, he talks about how people at Covenant seem to respond in the years following Elizabeth's murder. But more importantly for this episode, he touches on some of the institutional issues at play and sets the stage for those wider PCA dynamics that we want to talk about. Because even though Luke is mostly talking about Covenant Seminary here, I think it's still relevant at the larger scale of the PCA. You walk past this every day on your way to several classes, and, and you're learning theology and Hebrew and church history just steps down from where uh, someone had their life taken from them in such brutal fashion. What I sensed from a lot of people was just, we're, we're wanting to get away from this, we're wanting to move on. And again, that was my sense. I could be I could be totally wrong. 
And I say that not in in the sense of you know, my pursuit of my master's degree and my seminary education was unsettling or bad. It wasn't. You know, I, I have profited incredibly well uh, from the professors and from the education, the community that I experienced at Covenant Seminary. As time went on, I guess th this can also be something about me. I tend to brood a lot at very, you know, unfortunate times. And I kept thinking, hmm, this happened. And this is what I'm experiencing now. It seems to be a safe place. It's a very grace drenched place. It, it's a place where, where people are accepting of each other. And yet this happened. Why? <laughs> and, and, and so I was very unsettled, I guess, by this, um, I, I guess I would call it an existential incongruence where you're learning about the, the building blocks of your faith, but the, the idea of, of grace and community and hope. And it's in the midst of the, the geographical space of where the exact opposite of that happened before you arrived. And, and, it, and it's something that uh, I guess I wasn't able really to uh, to put that together. And, and it's, um, that, that was probably the thing about my education that disturbed me the most. And it also unsettled me that people were unwilling to engage it. Not that I felt like it had to be a, a point of um, conversation at, at dinners and gatherings and everything like that. But I was just like, I, I, I just don't, I'm not the type of person who believes in, in burying tragedy. I remember even when 9-11 happened and I was a teacher up in Charlottesville, Virginia. That was an incredibly, that just rocked all our student body and our faculty. And I remember the next day, we just took time in our Bible classes to allow our students to ask questions, the why, and every, which I thought was really valuable. And we got some pushback from some faculty uh, saying, you, you know, and so, some of them were remembered their elementary school days from when Kennedy was shot and the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the whole idea is just keep things going as normally as possible. And I, I, th I think, you know, there was still part of that worldview at Covenant then, uh, that's if it doesn't need to be rocked, don't rock it, don't slow down, don't put roots into the tragedy that aren't don't need to be put there. So I think w w would they do things differently now? I think it's entirely reasonable to suspect they might, but only Covenant Seminary can answer that question. And I think the the default mode of human beings in Congress with one another and in, in an organizational mode is that, um, you know, when things are going good, you don't attach the negative to it. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's natural. I'm not saying that's right, uh, but, but that's natural. But I think that can happen at a great deal in any organization of any type. And we, we've seen that in churches. We've seen that in, in different ministry structures that have turned abusive and everything. This is going great. You're making great impact. Why would you bring this up and bring this person or this ministry down? And, and so that's where we still see evidence of that. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes uh, Christian institutions are often more institution than Christian, uh, but I'm not saying that about Covenant Seminary, but, but we do see that uh, a great bit uh, even today. I will say this, Covenant Seminary is not unique in terms of the way that it confronts tragedy. Uh, there, there, you know, one time I asked, I was interviewing at a school and uh, the, one of their students the year before uh, had tried to commit suicide. And so I, I asked kind of what uh, they, they had, uh, you know, what's your approach to tragedy? Because I was, I was interviewing for like a spiritual life director position there. And so I was thinking this, is, this would be good information to have. What's the policy? What's the, the path? And I remember them changing the subject to, to something else totally and thinking to myself, what just happened here? <laughs> why, why, is, why is it? But, but that's something that Covenant Seminary, for, for lack of a better term, and, and I, I don't think they were trying to be dismissive 
uh, of her memory, uh, unless there, there's information I don't have. But I think this points to a larger tragedy of how, okay, we don't understand what happened. What happened is really terrible. But don't hide behind your fear for heaven's sake and go on acting like nothing happened. Because if you do, it might seem advisable in the short term, but you're going to have a lot of wreckage. And some people might say, you know, for me at least, it, it took me a long time to come to, to grips with thinking that reaction to that tragedy is one thing. What I'm learning in class is a totally different thing. And there's no connection there. You know, there, there are two different approaches to this. And I don't know why I'm getting that. And so that that's, I, I think in a way, I'm still... I don't know about upsets, but but I'm having a hard time coming to grips with why people, and I'm just speaking to my own tribe here, in the Christian faith, why is that their default mode? What do you have to lose by being countercultural? Why does that seem to be the default mode of so many Christian institutions? In last week's bonus content, you heard Ruth and I talking about more or less that same thing. Why aren't these institutions radically different in the way they handle tragedy or scandal? What does the reaction to Elizabeth's death in 1990 and today teach us about how Christians respond to tough subjects? Now, one person who's very familiar with how Christian institutions operate is Julie Royce. She's a Christian investigative journalist and the founder of The Royce Report, a Christian media outlet which, according to their website, focuses on exposing corruption, abuse, and what's been termed the evangelical industrial complex. Here, Julie talks about the PCA's governance structure and how what might be great in theory isn't always great in practice. In its theology, it's conservative like maybe a Southern Baptist convention would be, which is the largest denomination of the Protestant Church. But what would be a little bit different about PCA, whereas in the Southern Baptist Church, you have autonomous churches, which really govern themselves, and they can kind of choose how much they want to be a part of the regional bodies and the national bodies. Within the PCA, you've got, at the local level, the session governing everything that they do. Then at that more regional level, you have the Presbytery, which is this regional governing body, and then you have the General Assembly, which is the national governing body. And if you want to be PCA, I mean, that's voluntary, but if you're in it, there actually is a governance of it, which a lot of people would look at and say, oh, that means that if there's concerns or problems, there's a body we can appeal to and these will be taken care of. And I, I think a lot of folks that are critical of just the, you know, the mega church or the independent church, which there's tons of those within evangelicalism, which would look to the PCA and might say, hey, you know, they've got a system for dealing with problems. The problem is they haven't seemed to deal any better with the problems than these independent churches, which really, you know, as a lot of people view them, they're kind of like the wild, wild west. Well, you know, a lot of people look at the PCA as the good old boys network. And so if you're not part of that, you know, good luck getting justice. So, Ruth, you're a little more up to speed than I am on some of the issues that have been going on in the PCA recently. So can you give us some examples of some of these problems that Julie might be referring to there? Without getting into specifics about lots of individual cases, because that's really beyond the scope of this project, um, there is one high-level recent case that comes to mind where the church court, which the PCA has its own system of a court uh, to litigate issues within its own body got really tangled up. And the allegation in that case is that the pastor and his friends essentially hung up this case for a long time and that it was impossible for the woman in the issue, the complainant, to get justice 
One of the issues that came up in that case, too, was um, whether people who are not Christians should be allowed to testify in church court cases. And so, again, without getting into big specifics about that case, the, the basic tension is when we have an issue in the church, is that really an issue among Christians? And at what point should a third party, like somebody's friend or a nurse at a hospital or a counselor, be allowed to weigh in and say, yes, I believe this. Yes, I witness this. Yes, I'm concerned about this problem. Um, And so when Julie calls it a good old boys club, I think part of what she's referring to is how much should the inner workings of the PCA and problems within the PCA be figured out by people within the system? And how much should we allow other people who are not elders and pastors weigh in and help figure out issues? Okay, Ruth, I'm going to play devil's advocate here a little bit. So that's all really interesting and worth talking about, but what does it have to do with the unsolved murder of Elizabeth McIntosh? I totally agree. And and I think that's what we're trying to figure out in this episode, but also in the series, right? Like, what from 1990 connects to 2023 and 24? And we're not going to get into every case, and we're not claiming that Covenant Seminary or the PCA Seminary is all bad or that we know everything about these recent complaints. But what we have heard, what I have heard from people reacting to our episode is that they do feel that there is a connection. Um, We've heard from dozens of people, mostly women, who connect Elizabeth's case and how it was handled to their recent experiences in the PCA. Not all negative, some positive, but some pretty negative. And so something resonates, right? Like something about Elizabeth being a woman at a seminary, being killed, and justice, generally speaking, not being found in her case resonates with them. And so people have brought up to me, you know, anything from stuff as general as, hey, I was a woman in a church and, um, you know, I just noticed the sense that I was never listened to in the same way as my husband, for example, all the way up to very serious allegations of um, sexual misconduct and domestic abuse that people have experienced. And so I'm not saying that all of those cases are connected to Elizabeth McIntosh's case, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that the themes resonate for people, um, that something here resonates, that people feel like they need an outlet to talk about these situations. And I would also just say thanks to everybody who's reached out. So Julie, we've had people express to us some level of reluctance to speak on these kinds of things. And it's not because they feel overtly threatened by anyone, but it's more a general sense of like, I don't want to be the troublemaker. I don't want to rock the boat. You know, Paul talks about deal with your disputes amongst yourselves and don't take it to court. So what do you say to people when they say those kinds of things to you? Well, it's really interesting how certain selective verses keep being used over and over again. So when it's to the pastor's advantage, and he has a bully pulpit, right? So he can preach. You know, what is that? 1 Corinthians 6, don't take your brother to court, right? And he can, the one that I hear all the time is Matthew 18. So Matthew 18 sort of outlines uh, steps to take in personal disputes, okay? So this is a personal dispute. So a personal dispute means, you know, like you got a problem with Bob because Bob took your mower and he wrecked it and then he gave it back and like didn't reimburse you for it. That's a personal problem, right? You got a problem with Bob. So you go to Bob and you say, you know, Bob, we have a problem. Bob doesn't listen to you, Scripture says, then take a couple more with you. And then you say, Bob, we got a problem. And he doesn't listen to them either. So then it says, take him to the whole church. And if he doesn't listen to the whole church, then, you know, basically publicly expose him. That's for a personal issue. What I don't hear preached on hardly ever in the church is First Timothy 5.20. And that says that when an elder is sinning, that he should be publicly exposed so that others may stand in fear. The scripture has a very clear way of dealing with sinning elders, with sinning pastors, with men in authority or women in authority who are misusing their power. 
that person is to be publicly exposed. And this is what, uh, there's so few people that, that hear this. And then it's actually, it's spiritual abuse, the way that pastors will then, when they have something to cover up, will we'll talk about gossip and slander. Again, slander, for something to be slandered, it has to be false. When you're trying to do exactly what 1 Timothy 5.20 says, you're not slandering, you're not gossiping, you're trying to expose, right? Like Ephesians says, that we should have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. When evil is going on within the church, when sin is going on within the church, it affects the whole body. You know, if you're familiar with your Old Testament, Achan's sin, a lot of people died because of Achan's sin, because he had not done what God had said, and he had buried you know, silver in his tent and had not destroyed it like he was supposed to. It infects the whole body. God's really serious about sin. And then you, you often hear, well, don't air your dirty laundry. Well, it's amazing to me that God never said that in the, in the Old or New Testament, don't air your dirty laundry. In fact, what he did is he humiliated his own people because they were sinning, right? I mean, he, he sent them to Babylon. And that's what he did. So, I mean, we have a God who's very serious about sin, who has said expose sin, especially among your leaders. And in fact, we're, we're told that those of you who teach, not all of you should want to teach because they get judged more harshly. So if you have people in authority and they are sinning, you have a responsibility to expose them. You have a responsibility to say something. And those that are trying to silence you, quite frankly, are engaging in spiritual abuse, and it's wrong. Here's Kyle Hackman talking about the origins of Presbyterianism and how that culture is struggling to find its way forward in 21st century America. As a reminder, Kyle's my high school friend who first told me about Elizabeth's murder, and he's also a PCA pastor. I'd say there's a variety of things that have greatly changed in society. One, generally, is that Presbyterianism as a form of church government is rooted or is first experimented in the 17th century in Scotland in a country that's about the size of South Carolina that has a population of about a million. And as this type of, this this style of Christianity, these people are convinced this is coming, how the Bible tells us to govern the church and they're bringing it into the North American world. All of a sudden, uh, the system that previously was pretty tight knit and in close quarters one with another is now spread over vastly different regions. And it now has something like 400,000 members. And so the, the system is under great stress, and it's not exactly sure how to function in this growing setting that's in. I'd also say just the way we communicate in society has changed like crazy, and the PCA is dealing with and wrestling with the same things most organizations and institutions are dealing with, especially Christian institutions. For the longest time, gentlemen don't sit around the table, and they don't talk about politics, and they don't talk about other people's dirty laundry. And that paradigm seemed to work for a season, at least for the people who were at the top. We now live in a world where the second a scandal happens, everybody becomes a journalist and they can document what they've seen and experienced immediately on Twitter. And so to not talk about things, which previously was the gentleman thing to do, now fits this sort of narrative of why are they silent? Why aren't they responding when everyone else is talking about us? Why are they ignoring us? I think that change has caused a tremendous impact on all institutions. And so whenever there's a scandal that let's say is in New Mexico, though I am in Toronto and you're in St. Louis, we're both reading about that scandal almost minutes after it happens. And we are immediately trying to wrestle through what do we think about this scandal? What ought to happen? And it begins to feel overwhelming. Also, I would just say that the internet has allowed all these voiceless people to all of a sudden have a voice. So of course, our generation feels like there are so many scandals coming out because everyone is finally finding their voice. Previously, they felt silenced. Now, through the power of the internet, they can vocalize the ways in which they have been mistreated. And so for an institution to still play by the old rules of gentlemen don't talk about these things is to put themselves in a situation where those who feel voiceless are raising their voice. Many of us are beginning to see and hear these stories and they're saying, these people, we're saying these people are now our neighbors in some senses. What, what duty do we owe to these people as we hear 
some of these stories of oppression and abuse and difficulty, and silence just won't work anymore. I'd also say there's an, another big cultural clash that's taking place, and that is that the place of the pastor is greatly changing in society. So in society, you have society secularizing more and more, but at the same time, you also have society specializing more and more. And whereas pastors with their masters of divinity used to be the most educated people, not just in their church, but in their town, and everyone wanted their opinion on how they ought to think and act, now all of a sudden, they're generalists, and there's people who know virtually every subject better than them. There's counselors in their church who understand some complexities of mental illness so much better than they do. And there's uh, people who work with children that understand child protection policies so much better than the minister does. And all of a sudden, these people who are, are from a guild where for the longest time they were the most educated, they were the sages, they were the wisest, all of a sudden are now put in a position where they're being somewhat humbled and they're having to learn from a lot of other experts. They're no longer the smartest person in their church, much less the city in which they live in. I would just say the PCA is feeling this pressure because at the same time that society is secularizing and the church is sort of losing influence in the world and there's all kinds of traditional Christian ethics being called into question, there is also pressure for the church to listen to the wisdom of the world. So it's almost as though you have these people trying to discredit the church from the quote-unquote world, and yet there's also people from the quote-unquote world who are offering great wisdom as to how to move forward. And this has put a lot of ministers especially in something of a bind. They need to wrestle through what do they think about critical race theory. If it didn't originate in the heads of a Christian, what benefit is it to us? Is it trying to destroy Christianity, or is it a tool that can be a blessing to Christianity? The PCA saw this last year. There was an overture, a request that all ministers need background checks before they can get ordained. That motion was referred back a year because there were some questions about how it should operate. I don't know exactly why everyone voted as they did. It seems to me that Presbytery I'm ordained in has required background checks for many years. It seems to me a no-brainer to pass, but some of the speeches I heard expressed real concerns about this sort of outside and worldly credentialing body being able to weigh into the process of someone becoming a minister. So I would say all these changes are coming together, the changes about what it means to be Presbyterian, the changes about what it means to be a minister, and the changes about how we communicate, they're all colliding in our world in real time. And I think the way that they're colliding is making many in the PCA so incredibly curious about this murder. They're wondering why it feels as though the seminary doesn't want to participate in continued public journalism. Why, why the seminary doesn't want to work with journalism to make sure the story gets better coverage. And because we live in a time where there has been a vast number of abuse scandals uncovered, the assumption when someone doesn't speak is that there's something that they're hiding. At this point, I have no reason to believe Covenant Seminary is actually hiding anything. I really don't. However, not speaking puts them in a situation where they fit a template of how institutions previously operated and in this world of new communication, to be silent and to not participate as much as possible puts them, uh, if puts people, the listener, sort of the, the, the reader in a situation where their minds fill in the blanks, I believe incorrectly, that there's some kind of cover up. And so I think all these changes are taking place, the culture's changing rapidly, and we're at a place now where it's time to talk about this. Another journalist who's been covering issues in the PCA is Liam Adams, religion reporter for The Tennessean. Liam focuses on faith and religion, especially things happening in major denominations in the South. Recently, he's written several good stories about how churches and institutions are responding to questions of abuse and misconduct. We recommend some of his recent coverage of the Nashville Presbytery in the PCA. Here, Liam talks about the over-reliance that many within the PCA have on their own systems to deal with abuse. 
This is an issue within the PCA, but it's not exclusive to the PCA, which is that we can handle this on our own. And so that lends to a trust in the PCA system of governance, which is very complicated, and also a trust in we don't have to explain ourselves to the outside world. I mean, you both have encountered this challenge with getting certain records from Covenant Seminary um, and just sort of an overall transparency. Um, this is common throughout the denomination. And again, it's not the only denomination that is dealing with these issues. But I think it's just important that there's this sense of sort of reliance on their own system of governance, their own theology on each other. And you have this sort of groundswell within the PCA that's saying it's not good enough. Like your reliance on yourselves is not holding people accountable who should be held accountable. But the issue is still, there are a lot of people in the PCA that think this is not happening or that this is not a widespread issue in the denomination. And from all the victim advocates that I'm speaking to, they're saying, yes, it is. And just to make sure we're clear, what what is the this that you're thinking of when you say that? That there, well, there's one an issue of clergy misconduct and clergy abuse, both sexual abuse, domestic abuse, spiritual abuse, um, or abuse of power. Um, and then just an issue with holding ministers accountable or that the systems that exist, which is really grounded in the presbyteries, that's the whole name of the denomination and the whole system that it's built around, that the presbyteries, um, it's kind of a patchwork of certain presbyteries taking a lot of action, um, or, or taking, being proactive in, implementing changes to holding ministers accountable and that there are other presbyteries that kind of operate like an old boys club. Do you think the system works? So I'll speak on behalf of those who have interviewed for these stories. And when I'm talking to alleged abuse victims, talking to victim advocates, and I'm talking to PCA ministers who have been really helping spearhead this effort for greater accountability, they say it, it doesn't work, or at least that there are some major issues that need to be dealt with in order for it to work better. And that's the whole point of the DASA report. So just a quick explainer, um, as quick as you can make a three-year process and like a 200-page report, uh, Presbyterians are not very good at brevity. But the, the general concept of the DASA report, um, and, and I do think it's really important to say that the PCA is aware of these types of issues and questions, and that this big denominational effort was made to address these questions, just like individual churches and presbyteries make efforts to. But anyways, the DASA report, um, my former pastor, Tim LaCroix, served on the committee that put this together. It basically was responding to questions from pastors and congregants who said, look, we have the Bible, we have the Westminster Confession, we have the Book of Church Order. All of those things are like church things. They don't always connect with the individual incidents and situations we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. How do we help people dealing with domestic abuse, sexual abuse, child abuse, and spiritual abuse? And so this committee, which included pastors, as well as um, independent clinical experts and psychologists, really just ran through that list of issues. And they looked at both defining them um, using both biblical terminology and clin clinical terminology, which I think is important. And then they offered up general recommendations for how churches should handle those types of issues. And they didn't get into, you know, super specific levels, but I thought it was a really valuable effort at saying, hey, here are best practices that clinical experts use, and we're not really seeing every church use this best practice. You really need to think about doing this in your church. And so 
for example, you know, there's recommendations that um, if a couple in a church is experiencing um, domestic abuse, like one partner is being abused by another, don't do marriage counseling with them. That's not going to work. Don't send the husband to anger management therapy if he's the aggressor. Those are things that I know churches have tried. And the report says that does not work. It increases the likelihood of harm. And it's more likely to make things unsafe. So all that to say, it's it's addressing these very specific questions um, and aims to kind of set up a framework where churches can improve their responses to these types of issues. There, there's a lot of phrases in that report that I think are relevant to how we're trying to talk about Elizabeth's case. And again, like not saying that how her case was handled is abusive, but I do think the general concepts resonate. There, there's some lines in that report of like, you know, evil thrives on darkness. And so they, they generally make the recommendation of transparency is a good policy as long as the victim wants her case to be public, report things to police if the victim wants it to be reported to police. And so avoiding, essentially avoiding a default that I think is common in a lot of churches to handle everything internally. They recommend bringing in third parties. They recommend talking to experts. And they say that, look, like pastors are not always equipped to handle these things and it's okay to ask for help. So I I find that valuable and praiseworthy. Here's Liam Adams again. Yeah, I think this phenomenon of the establishment of committees and subcommittees and task forces and groups and subgroups is, in a lot of these cases, comes off to abuse survivors as basically ineffective, inefficient, clogging up the system to just getting done what needs to get done. And there's a lot of legitimacy to that feeling, especially when these survivors have, and victims and people have been wronged by the system, they've been, you know, they come forward with their claims within the system, and then they're tossed off to this committee or they're tossed off to this system. And it's just this handoff where nobody's actually dealing with their allegation of misconduct and taking disciplinary action against a minister. At the same time, I think that these reforms in the PCA or in the SBC and these other denominations that are dealing with these issues right now, it has to be done in the system. Or another way to put it is with it being done in the system is the only way that a large portion of the ministers, the people who are sort of actively part of the system are gonna buy in. They trust the mechanisms of the denomination. They trust the polity. So if you're gonna get them on board, you need to go through these internal channels. But there's, again, kind of the um, the struggle, the conflict, um, the dilemma, because abuse survivors and victims feel like this is just, this is not helping at getting done what needs to get done and what should get done quicker. And so I think there's really a question of like how these committees are formed. I think the DASA committee, it, I, I don't know how people felt when it was established back in 2019 and it took three years for it to get there. But the result of it is that it started a really important conversation in the PCA. And in the SBC, there was a third party report that came out in 2022. And that also was led by an internal committee within the denomination. And that led to a really important conversation in the denomination. But right now in the SBC, there's an abuse reform implementation task force that is taking longer than a lot of people thought it would at implementing certain reform. And so people are getting pretty impatient with it. And it seems like there might be a recommendation for a more long-term solution, but people wanted some of these reforms to be done now and not to be passed along to the next committee or group or agency. And so I think there's a real kind of dilemma and conflict 
with how these evangelical groups deal with these issues of misconduct and abuse because you need this sort of system buy-in and that a lot of times that requires going through these internal denominational channels. But I think those internal denominational channels also need to be aware of the optics. And if they're taking too long and the optics are bad and abuse survivors who have been more patient than they ever should have been with these guys are gonna get increasingly less patient and I think that these denominations need to be, be aware of that as they're determining how they go about uh, using their internal systems to deal with these issues. Now I want to hear from someone who personally experienced some of those issues. Catherine Spearing is a graduate from Covenant Seminary and the founder of Tears of Eden, an organization focused on spiritual abuse in the American Evangelical Church. She told us that she still really appreciates the time she spent at Covenant, but like many graduates, Catherine didn't learn about Elizabeth's murder until many years after she graduated. For her, the Cold Justice episode that aired last year was the first she ever heard about it. It's not so much that we should have been told, it's that her story should have been remembered. That was a big deal. She was a student at the seminary, and she died on seminary campus while she was working for the school. Like, it just seems so fishy and weird that it was, like, just utterly, completely erased from this part of the story. And it would be different if it wasn't like, oh, because it was 30 years ago, and, like, you know, it would come up sometimes in conversation, and, you know, and everyone kind of knew that this happened. It was, like, nothing. It, it feels like it was covered up. It feels like it was erased. That is the feeling that I got. And it feels like, in my opinion, a metaphor for the way that women are treated in the PCA. Just as a complete erasure of this woman's story. And then just that feeling of erasure of women in general and women's voices and their dignity and their respect. No one would ever say that. (laughs) No one would ever overtly say that. It's just done in a very different way and a very quiet, subtle, very nice way in the name of protection and compassion and kindness and respect. They say my voice matters, but then when I speak, I don't really feel like anyone's listening. Or they say they value my opinion, but when I share my opinion, it's like I'm not even there. Or, you know, like it was just like little things like that over and over and over again. And then things like the, like you can't have the title pastor and you can't have the title elder. I was like, okay, cool. Like I don't need the title to do the thing that I love, like whatever. So naively thinking, oh, the title doesn't matter. And they say the title doesn't matter, not realizing how it would just show up and just like devaluing of if people would listen to me or not, or if people respected me or not, or if my work was valuable or not. And just the like default posture whenever I was on a male female team that I would do the administration and then he would do the discipleship. Or I could meet with students, but that was kind of like an extra part of my job and like didn't really count if the spreadsheets weren't done. Um, And then when I realized like I wanted to teach, like actually like teach people and then kind of just had um, uh, leaning towards that and a little bit of a gifting for that. I'm a writer, I'm a storyteller um, and would just always think of like, especially in youth ministry of like, oh, it'd be really cool to like show this clip from Mean Girls and like talk about this, you know, part of the Bible being, you know, being the gospel being inclusive and, you know, like I'd always have these like ideas for like talks that I wanted to do. And so this was like something that I wanted to do, but this unspoken feeling of like, if I wanted to do that and said that I wanted to do that, that I was asking too much and that that really wasn't primarily what I was supposed to do. But then after sitting through dozens and dozens and dozens of like male teachers who were terrible, (laughs) most of them are terrible. Some of them are really great, but most of these teachers are not that great. So it was just kind of like, why can't I do this? Like, 
it's not like the standards that high of like, like what the quality of teaching that we're looking for here. So even if I'm just new to this and I'm just practicing, like you're letting them practice. So why can't you let me practice? Like, why can't you give me the same opportunity to grow in this gift? And the subtle message was basically, I wasn't supposed to have that gift. Like that wasn't supposed to be something I was good at or wanted to do. Second tier. Yeah, yeah. You weren't treated the same and your work wasn't treated the same. The interesting part of it, and this is, I don't know if this is better or worse than what I grew up with, but they would never say you didn't have value. They would never say you were not a full human. They would they would say, oh, you're a woman. You are just as important as men. Like they would totally say that. They would say it. They would die on that sword. Like absolutely 100% say that. But then I realized a small sect of people, men, got to decide what respecting women looked like and got to decide what protecting women looked like and got to decide what it meant to honor women or to listen to women's voices. And the women actually didn't get a say in that. And so like these churches now have things like women's advisory boards or, you know, the three token women that are allowed to come into the session before they go into executive session and they pat themselves on the back. I'm like, look, we listen to women, Um, but they don't actually listen in those spaces. And so then if you dare to say something like, hey, the way that you announced, you know, that women's retreat and like calling us the ladies and like, it just like, you just kind of placated us and like pat us on the head and yeah, just like very, just like demeaning. And like, if I were to say, hey, I didn't feel respected by the way that you did that. And hey, at the next service, can you, can you say that that just a little bit differently and keep this in mind? The response would be like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? What do you like? What do you What do you mean? I didn't respect you because the paradigm was created by a small number of people. That there's kind of a lack, <laughs> lack of awareness or deliberate ignoring and denial of that power dynamic that it even exists. And I will just like use the boss that I had in the church in California for example, who was abusive, and just my experience of calling it out and going to people in leadership for help and documenting things and screenshotting things and immediately after an incident would happen, go immediately to his supervisor so that things were on record and documented. And uh, up until the very, very end, there were a couple people that got a little more involved and we're like, something's not right here and and started to like maybe see something was off. But in general, we were treated like two peers having a conflict and they would just like put us in these rooms and try to create conflict resolution situations and like ask me right in front of him, do you forgive him? I'm like, F- no, <laughs> like, no, we're not even at that. Like you're like completely missing what is happening here? And that is when the church itself, trauma, yes, that's important. But you can't even get there if you're not aware of power and how that shows up in these spaces. And in a church where men are always in charge, like you're going to have abuse and you're going to have a lot of these men getting away with it because their bros are going to protect them because they're identifying with their other bro. When when your friends were all texting you after watching Cold Justice and you were kind of processing it, what did you or other people start to say about what Covenant should do? I don't feel compelled to challenge the PCA to do something different. I just don't think they're going to. That's my opinion, and that's why I eventually left, because I just, I just don't think... It's just not, so many people have fought, so many people have fought, so many people are fighting currently, and it just, it just feels like it can't be saved. That's my, that's my perspective. I want Elizabeth to be honored, and so I have a podcast about her. I'm excited that you all are doing this. Um, I think that story needs to be remembered, despite what Covenant does with it, but asking Covenant to do something different than what it's already done. I just don't think it's, it cares. 
I don't think Covenant cares. I don't think the PCA cares. So I'm not going to demand that they do something that is outside of their capacity, unfortunately. Hey, TJ. So as we've put together this project, lots of people have reached out to us with, you know, positive, negative experiences with the PCA. I thought it was really important to include Catherine's experience because she references a positive experience at Covenant, which is great, but she also references tough stuff that she went through working with churches in the PCA and how she feels about that and why she thinks it connects to Elizabeth's murder. So I'm, I'm just really glad that we were able to talk with her about that. Um, and represent that experience in this project. So some people are gonna hear Catherine's interview and they're gonna say, aha, so True Believer is saying that because the PCA doesn't ordain women, therefore PCA is bad. And that's what this whole series is really all about, the PCA's treatment of women. That's our secret motive here. So is that our secret motive here? The hidden agenda. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, you and I have our opinions, Catherine has her opinion, but this project is not pushing a political or theological debate about what the PCA should do beyond saying that every institution needs to listen to its members and hear feedback from members. Catherine was one. This is her feedback. Um, We've interviewed plenty of other people with other thoughts and opinions, and so I'm not being wishy-washy. I'm just saying it's not my role to say what the PCA should do, but I do hope that people within the PCA listen to this interview, consider her experience, and then incorporate that as they think about how to treat women and how to treat uh, questions of spiritual abuse and other types of abuse. Here's Ewan Kennedy, who graduated from Covenant Seminary and was in the PCA for over 30 years. Yeah, I think it's I think it's endemic to uh, some of the, the the pathology of the PCA. It's not just limited to the PCA. Obviously, I mean we've seen the news. The Southern Baptist Convention, you know, has been exposed for covering up uh, accusations of sexual abuse uh, and allowing pastors to move around, just like we saw with the Roman Catholic Church, you know, for many many years. And other places uh, where things have been swept under the carpet uh, in order to kind of maintain a public face and justice has been uh, denied and truth has been squashed and transparency has been rejected. Uh, And so I I understand that there are politics and perception. You want to be careful in things, but uh, the PCA, the Southern Baptist Convention, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, many mega church, uh, do not, you know, independent churches. You know, I think we've seen over the past 10 or so years, at least since the Me Too movement, just how there was a culture uh, where it was accepted to sweep things under the carpet and not bring things to light. And uh, I'm thankful to live in, you know, in 2023, uh, where uh, we understand that that's not okay. Obviously, you're not responsible for all Christians everywhere and for fixing all the problems. But what would you like to see Covenant and the PCA do differently in terms of a new path forward on this? I mean, I think uh, I'm not the originator of this idea. It may have been uh, Doug Servan, your dad, uh, Ruth, who talked about you know having a, an annual day of remembrance and the chapel closest to the date of Elizabeth's murder to have it referenced and to pray for her and for her family and to pray for justice. You know, or even a plaque to say this happened on this date and we lament it and we look to God and to the new heavens and the new earth, you know, for justice and for our tears to be wiped away. Some kind of acknowledgement about this ongoing unsolved murder. And it would be one thing if the murder was solved and there was some closure for it, for it to be unsolved, the only unsolved murder in the history of the Korea Corps Police Department, uh, for it to have happened at Covenant Seminary and to be this open thing, and for it not to be acknowledged, that just contradicts the whole spirit of the Bible 
about lament uh, and the call for justice and the longing for justice, especially for a denomination that's Presbyterian and is meant to have a special place in its heart for the Psalms of lament. There's been no lament. There's been no lament. I've been a PCA pastor for, you know, uh, 30 years, been in, involved in what well, been involved in the PCA for 30 years, been an ordained PCA pastor for 20 plus years, and I've never participated in any lament over this, apart from the lament that fellow pastors and I have had in discovering and discussing this. And that's just not okay. That's just not biblical at all. And so, yeah, even now today, having graduated 23 years ago, I still think Covenant Seminary is the best place in the world to go, you know, to, to learn how to be a pastor and to learn how to study God's Word uh, and to learn how to study God's Word for what it is and not through the lens of a pre-commitment to theology, but the politics and the lack of honesty in the PCA, if you were asking me, hey, where should I go to school? I'd say Covenant Seminary. If you're asking me which denomination should I pursue licensure and ordination in, I would say I'm not sure about the PCA anymore. Here's Kyle Hackman again. I believe the PCA, especially in the domestic abuse and sexual assault report, what's often called the DOSA report, did an excellent job of consulting outside wisdom and the best resources in the counseling world and in the social work world and in the child, the abuse advocacy world and thinking of ways in which to create a safe environment for everyone to flourish in the PCA. And I think that report was a, a model of wrestling hard through resources maybe that came from outside of the church but could be best used for the sake of, of the good of the church. This would be something I'd say the PCA is doing really well I don't want to say the PCA is doing bad necessarily at something. That would be hard for me to say very clearly. But I would say the PCA is struggling most with realizing, though we think ordination is very important and it's from the Bible and we think it accompanies a real authority, we don't necessarily know what to do with the fact that there's experts all around us that often know more than we do. I would say the PCA is also struggling, and, and this, is, this is understandable, but with power dynamics. In one side of their uh, their lives, they're seeing the, the power of a minister being, the authority of a minister being kind of mocked and rejected, and the minister's word is not that influential and important anymore. And at the same time, they're unaware of the way in which the power they do have is sometimes used to influence and do harm on others. Just by virtue of the power that they have, they're not often interacting with equals people submit to them in a different way than they submit to an equal. And some of those power dynamics amongst ordained people uh, should give us pause as to how we conduct ourselves and uh, how we operate and say and don't say certain things. Those would be some things that come to mind. I would also just say the PCA is struggling, especially, it seems to me, on, on a more centralized level, the PCA is struggling with what to do with the loss of cultural power. And one of the things journalism does is it, it does rob some measure of power from institutions. It's out of your hands. Someone else is dealing with this story. You know, I'm taking this interview. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to be edited and how it will come out. And that loss of power is no one's sure exactly what to do as the influence of the church grows less and less. In my opinion, projects like this are part of my public apologetic my public defense of Christianity in this changing world. I think showing that we can talk about these things and trying to move this case forward is part of my public witness to the fact that I believe Jesus died for my sins, rose from the dead, and ascended to heaven, even if I live in a world that thinks this stuff might be crazy. When we interviewed Liam Adams, he talked about the importance of bringing changes within the system rather than let's tear the whole system down, let's work within yeah. the system to bring changes. What do you think about that? Is it important yeah. to work within the system? Yeah, I mean, the PCA is a reformed denomination, and I think we believe institutions are good, they get corrupted, and they must be reformed. I think we have no problem saying institutions are for the good of people around us, 
But they can get to a place where they do more evil than good. And I'm not implying Covenant Seminary or the PCA is doing more evil than good. Don't hear me say that at all. I think the PCA is in a place where we are working through, especially with this DASA report, this domestic abuse and sexual assault report, we're working through reforming from within. I think Liam is correct that for this to make the greatest impact on the greatest number of people, you have to go the slow way of turning the whole institution. You have to turn this big ship. And in one sense, you could say, burn it down, start all over again. But I think then you'd have a thousand little boats going in a thousand different directions. And if you really believe convictionally that the church is to be united, it is to work together to try to work in unity, and you believe there is to be some measure of accountability, one church over another, I think there has to be a concerted effort towards reform from within. One thing I'm not sure about that I don't know how to talk about, and I'm just saying this out loud to you, but I don't know that I think Elizabeth's death has a ton to do with the PCA as a whole, in the simple fact that no one in the PCA really knows about it. And so that that's kind of when we first were interacting about some of those interviews and the sort of people frustrated with the PCA. There's merit there, and it's worth exploring, and there are things that must be improved. Everyone in the PCA would say that. But this particular case doesn't seem to me to be a PCA-specific case in any unique way. And the PCA, there's just numerous people who've reached out to me who've never heard of this case and who are very excited for this podcast, who didn't for a second have concerns that something was going to be sort of taking down the PCA or taking down Covenant. They just thought, this is what Christians do. We ask hard questions. And so that's, that's my only reservation about even talking about the PCA is I know there are things that need to change in the PCA. Ruth has made some comments about how it feels to be, you know, a woman in the PCA. I, these things are real and they're worth thinking about. Elizabeth McIntosh, the PCA changes completely. We still have this problem of Elizabeth McIntosh. And that being said, Elizabeth would have been far more conservative than any of the people <laughs> that you're getting on this podcast. Yeah, I think it's more a question of like, what was the culture at the time and how did that maybe influence the way that things were handled? I do think the denominational culture, though the PCA would say we're not hierarchical, that the lowest person has a vote or a voice, I do think the PCA culture, especially 33 years ago, relied a lot on gentlemen and sort of reputable name sort of having more pow soft power maybe uh, over others. But I think any institution might have that. I think the biggest difference is what I said at the beginning, that there was this kind of culture that to be a good minister, you were also a good gentleman. And what it meant to be a gentleman, it doesn't compute with having Twitter. It doesn't compute with a world where people blog regularly. It just doesn't. And so gentlemen don't do these things 33 years ago, but we're now in a time where there's some obligation to speak. There's some obligation to, you, you owe it. To, someone's, someone has tragically and heinously died here. My dream would be that from this, you'd get incredibly rich and you'd give all your money away and there'd be a scholarship for older, you know, second career women who want to go to seminary. Like this would be a great way to honor her name. And also that people who were falsely accused, I mean, my dream would be that they, they aren't accused anymore and that their name gets cleared. Because part of the gentleman culture thing too is that people who might be innocent, but also might be guilty, you just don't talk about them because there's a chance. And I think that that's not healthy either. I think some people's names need to be cleared in this case. And instead, they've kind of been pushed to the back burner of PCA culture, maybe contributing to some of the difficulties of their marriage and of their life. Maybe there's a chance their lives could have gone down a different route. I don't know. But it does seem like you kind of push away problems. Uh, that, that's just sort of, you just don't, you don't talk about these problems. That, that to me seems to be part of a, a gentleman's culture that worked 33 years ago that I just don't see continuing in much of the modern world today. I also want to just say, I have tremendous compassion on the seminary. And I think I say this in the first episode, but I, I don't know if it can be reiterated anywhere. Our world has changed so much in 33 years. So my curiosity about this case and about the seminary was about the seminary 33 years ago and about policing 33 years ago and about journalism 33 years ago. And the way that this has kind of morphed into a story about the present is incredibly interesting to me. And I think I'm learning a lot about what's going on in the world around us. 
But at the end of the day, my my real passion and burden for this project, the reason why like I struggled to even sleep with sitting on some of the things that I discovered was that I really think there are enough people who know something about this case that have felt that because they're not certain, the best thing to do is to be quiet. And being quiet has resulted in this case never being closed. This idea of being a gentleman, not risking slandering somebody by going to the police when you think you have something that might be of importance, being willing to possibly get it wrong, but to let the police do their job well, to me, this has contributed uh, to this case not being solved. I understand 33 years ago those pressures that were on people. I guess my frustration is 33 years later, there's still people who know things, who will tell me things privately, but I don't think they've gone to the police with this information. And when you encourage them to do that, they say, well, I don't know how good my memory is anymore. I, I don't, I'm not certain. Well, that to me is, is this fear that you have to be certain before you speak of something. I, I'm not convinced that that's helping this case go forward. And so there still is some of this, be silent unless you can be certain. Now, I don't want to slander anyone either. I wish I could be certain about everything I said, but a woman's dead. I think the case is solvable. We've heard things from people that the police had not heard, just through word of mouth. I think there's more of this stuff out there. I think there's a sense in which maybe you don't need to speak up to a journalist, but it might be wise that some people at least call the Creve Corps Police Department and share some of what they've had to say and risk feeling like they may have got it wrong. I think you'll feel better saying it than bearing this your whole life, wondering if you have an important piece of information that you didn't share. And, and that's a cultural element that I just don't know how to get 33 years ago, how to get into people's psyche and convince them it's worth talking about these things. Here's Liam Adams again, talking about the connections he's found between what we've talked about in this series and the reporting that he's personally done. Yeah, I think overall the uh, seminary's resistance to sharing certain information with you or with the police, I think the lack of transparency is, I mean, it comes off as intentionally antagonistic, even if that's not the intention in and of itself. These denominations um, are not used to reporters, journalists, digging into some of this sensitive stuff. And it's kind of a new, for, for some of them, it's a new conversation. I mean, I know Covenant Seminary is used to the St. Louis newspaper reporting on the, the case of this murder, but in terms of the sort of internal operations and administrative decisions, or the relationship between the seminary and its lawyer, all of those things it sees as privileged and not of the concern to the members of the public. I think the issue you have there is that once this comes out in a podcast and people hear it and it feels like the seminary is being obstinate, it's, it's, it's intentionally, it's obfuscating, it's trying to prevent, like it, it looks like it's doing something wrong, even if maybe that's not the intention behind it. And so I think that was something that just really resonated with me when I was listening to it, speaking from my experience, as well as the experience of other people who write about religion and issues of misconduct and abuse in religious spaces, is this lack of transparency, because that's how the system always kind of operated. That's the sort of habit and I think my hope is for this podcast is to encourage and inspire the seminary to be as open as it possibly can. And that leads me to another point. What just resonated with me from the first episode was the person who you interviewed who was rereading that email, the sort of all caps email that was like, this is possibly the worst scandal, like in the whole, you know, all of evangelicalism, which I get a lot of those kinds of emails. <laughs> and I admit that I kind of scan through them, or sometimes I don't fully read all of them. But this was a really serious event at a prominent seminary for a prominent evangelical denomination. And there were more than 200 students there at that time. Many of them have gone into ministry in this denomination. And I think the questions that 
your friend was asking in that initial episode and that you, that has really sort of, I think, guided this podcast is what has been the larger effect that it's had on the denomination. And I think that you can make those ties between the seminary not fully cooperating with the police, for example, or the seminary telling students, hey, don't talk to the police unless they talk to you. These, this, this sends a larger message about how you deal with these kind of traumatic events and these events that have all these other layers around the treatment of women. And how is that then played out throughout the denomination? I think that this is why, I mean, like, just the more I listen to it, I'm not just saying this to be nice. Like, the more I was like, I was like, holy smokes, this has this larger denominational effect. This has an effect on the spirit of the denomination, you know? And ever since then, I mean, how many other people have come up through this seminary at this point, and this thing hasn't been resolved, and in this history, in this story, the seminary hasn't been as cooperative and as transparent as it, as it should have been. And so I think that that definitely has a larger effect on the denomination, the people who are uh, preaching its message. I recently saw the film Origin, which is a biographical drama about the writer Isabel Wilkerson. No spoilers here, but at the end of the film, Isabel's walking through an old house and we hear a voiceover describing her thoughts. The film is incredibly moving on its own, but this scene in particular made me weep. Because as it was playing out, I was thinking about Elizabeth and how her death has been handled. Here, I'll quote from that scene. When you live in an old house, you may not want to go into the basement after a storm to see what the rains have brought, but choose not to look at your own peril. We're all like homeowners who've inherited a house on a piece of land that's beautiful on the outside, but the soil is unstable. People say, I had nothing to do with how this all started. And yes, not one of us was around when this house was built. But here we are, the current occupants of a property with stress cracks built into the foundation and a roof that must be replaced. We are the heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. We didn't erect the uneven pillars, but they are ours to deal with now. The cracks won't fix themselves. Any more deterioration is on our watch. So, now that we've spent a couple episodes examining the culture around Elizabeth's murder, it's time to return to 1990 and what happened with the prime suspect, Michael, in the weeks, months, and years following the murder. Next time. True Believer is written, recorded, edited, mixed, and executive produced by TJ Ingracia. Co-written and co-produced by Ruth Servan-Smith. Research and development by Kyle Hackman and Doug Servan. Visit truebeliever.podcast.com to see additional materials related to each episode or to get in touch with us. If you're someone who knew Elizabeth or have any information related to her or her murder, we'd love to hear from you. Next time on True Believer. Do you think that whoever did this to Elizabeth should be punished by a higher authority than they do? Well, I believe, I believe that there's forgiveness for something like this from God. Mm -hmm. um, but if there, I would think that God would punish him. No, if it wasn't something that they confessed to God or anything like that, that should be punished. I think God does, let's put it that way.